Mauro Porcini, who is the Chief Design Officer at Pepsi, just published a new book titled The Human Side of Innovation. And in this episode, you'll learn all about the key message in the book, how it came to be, and why we need it now more than ever. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I am Mauro Porcini, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 163. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are those hidden things that make all the difference between success and failure? All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. The reason I'm excited to have Mauro back on the show is that he's sharing an important message that I feel should be heard by everyone in the design community and beyond. Baro captured this message in the book titled The Human Side of Innovation, The Power of People in Love with People that just got published. In this conversation, we explore some fascinating aspects of the book like how kindness is a competitive advantage in business, how human-centered design in its true nature is good for our planet, and what's love got to do with it. As a bonus, if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll learn how you can join the contest to win a signed copy of Morrow's book. If you enjoy conversations like this that help you to grow as a service design professional, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click that bell icon to be notified when new conversations are out. So that about wraps it up for the intro. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Mauro Porcini. Welcome back to the show, Mauro. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. And, uh, and such a good uh, occasion because we're going to talk about uh, the book that just came out uh, this month. Uh, Super awesome, super excited to dive, deep dive inside that. But before we do that, Mauro, as always, uh, the tradition is that the guest gives us a little bit of context about what they do and who they are. Uh, so could you please share that with us? I am the chief design officer of PepsiCo, the food and beverage uh, multinational corporation. I'm the first chief design officer of the company. I've been in this company for 10 years. I drive design, uh, innovation by design uh, for the entire portfolio of the company. Before that, I was the first chief design officer of 3M, the tech multinational corporation from Minnesota. I've been there for 10 years. I built the uh, design capability from scratch. So I'm saying first, mostly because it defines what kind of career path, what kind of journey I had, a journey of discovery and building something from scratch, it's been exciting, it's been difficult, it's been wonderful. Mm. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure if you're seeing this, but there is a pattern, 10 years at 3M, 10 years at PepsiCo, being like, mm, I'm, I'm feeling something new is on the horizon, Mara. <laughs> not really, I mean, a lot of people, even in PepsiCo are telling me, but no, I, I'm happy where I am and there are amazing challenges in front of us, so <laughs> <Awesome>. I'm here. <laughs> um, we have a lightning round that wasn't uh, in the episode because I said, welcome back to the show. You were here five years ago, episode 44. Uh, we didn't have a lightning round back then, but we do have one now. I have five questions for you. Your task is to answer them as quickly and as briefly as possible. Are you ready? I, I hate I hate those kind of things, but Good. go, go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm very curious, Mauro. The first question is, what's always in your fridge? Always in my fridge. Uh, I, I, I should say Pepsi, but uh, also a very good bottle of wine. All right. Uh, <laughs> if you could be an animal, which animal would you like to be? Um, Bella. <laughs> That's easier with me. So a Pomeranian. <laughs> a Pomeranian. Uh, now, which books or books are you reading at the moment, if any? Stage Not Age is the latest book I read. And then another one that I started last night, but is in Italian, but the book originally was not, but it's a gift of a, pre of a friend. In Italian, it say the Enneagramma dell'anima. So it's the Enneagram of the soul, but essentially it talks about different kinds of souls um, that define different kinds of personas, different kinds of people. And I'm so curious to read this book. 
Sounds good. I'll add a link in the show notes. Um, and question number four is, what did you want to become when you were a kid? I wanted to be either an author or an artist. I became a designer. <laughs> My book starts with that story. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the fifth and final question is, I had this question back five years ago, but I don't think you remember the question. When did you first hear about service design? I think we connected in LinkedIn, if I'm not wrong. It could be. I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't remember. It was so many years ago that like, so many things happened that it's difficult to remember. And uh, one thing, uh, so thank you. These were the five questions, but I have a bonus question for you. Uh, something maybe not a lot of people know is that you also have a podcast, right? I do. I have a podcast. It's called In Your Shoes with Mauro Porcini. And yes, I've been interviewing like you do many interesting guests but i don't have as many episodes and as you so but yeah it's still uh, going it's fun yeah, it's fun yeah. it's still uh, uh live because i saw the recent episode was quite recently yeah yeah yeah. it's still live mm. it's still live recommend so yeah it it for me it's been very interesting because there is this exchange with so many inspirational creative leaders from many different fields and obviously i bring to the table the experience in these corporations and what we're trying to do and the challenges so the conversations usually are pretty interesting but thanks for asking <laughs> <laughs> yeah hopefully you'll get some new subscribers uh, through the <laughs> through this episode um maro you recently very very recently uh launched a book uh which is called i'm going to cheat and uh make sure that i don't get it uh, incorrect the human side of innovation the power of people in love with people is that correct perfect 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 <laughs> so uh, a lot of questions around that um and by the way we're going to do a contest at the end of this episode to give away a signed copy so make sure you stick around till the end of this episode but my first question was for somebody who's so busy uh running a design department building design evangelizing design in a large multinationals multinational where did you find the time to write a book i don't know uh in in reality first of all as i write also in the book i always knew that i wanted to to write a book i i, I had this dream as a kid to to be a writer and so I started to take notes of everything in my professional world and in my private world since I was a kid. So I had so much material when at a certain point I was like, okay, now is the time to write a book. When was the time to write a book was when I was ready, you know, in my mind, uh, in uh, with my soul. And I can tell you more about this, but there was a specific time I was like, okay, now I can take everything I've been writing over the years and transform it in a book. But but then uh, I I didn't realize how much work a books require. And so here I am, I signed a contract with a publisher uh, five months before COVID and then COVID arrives. And that's the only reason why I was able to write a book like this, because at the time, because of the tragedy of COVID to stay home uh, to write every day, weekends, nights, I, I've been writing so much. Actually, I wrote the equivalent of at least two books. When the Italian publisher read the manuscript, it was the equivalent of 1,200, 300 pages uh, of a book. Uh, they were like, okay, these are definitely two or three books. And I knew, but even the fact that I wrote 1,300 pages knowing that I would have never published them, I knew it's too much. I think is the evidence of the fact that I was doing that before anything else for myself. And by the way, also for my daughter, I didn't know I was going to have a daughter, but I knew that sooner or later I was going to have a child or more. And so I was writing, literally, you know, putting it out there for people close to me and the closest, you know, arriving that could enjoy the content of this book was for sure uh, on top of obviously my significant other, my parents, my family, was my, my, my children. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's a great way to motivate yourself into putting in the effort to write. Write something for your kids or for your family um, because then it becomes something very real and very tangible like uh, you're doing it for them and you're leaving uh, a little bit, uh, a small piece of yourself when, uh, when you are gone. I mean, I think you need two ingredients. 
one uh, to enjoy what you're doing so that it's not a job you are doing it because you love it one is passion for variety and this is true for anything we do in life we need to love what we do and that's the ideal situation there are people that unfortunately need to do things that they don't love because this is the reality of life and it's very difficult for them to get out of their reality but for many of us we can choose but often we are trapped in situations uh, and that even if we don't like are comfortable and so the idea of getting out and do something that you really love is very important i love writing so that was one component the other one is what you just said is is the purpose why you're doing that so the how is enjoying it the why is your purpose and so for me writing a book and, and the books I will write in the future is is just fun mm. is a is a way for me to you know is a component of my happiness mm. and personal satisfaction it, it definitely resonates with me I don't know if you can see the poster behind me but it says I uh, love the game play to win and uh this definitely sounds like something that you love to do and uh, you do to win now before we, we I, i would love to do an entire episode with you just about writing but maybe that's going to be a, a sequel um but today i want to focus on on the key message of the book and sort of help people um get excited about it and maybe pick up the 1300 pages now i'm sure it became less uh about the book. So let's start with a, with a high level overview. And I know this is almost an impossible mission, but could you give us like a, a key summary? What is the book about? The book is a book about people. The, 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 if I need to summarize it in one sentence, this is a book about people in love with people. That is somehow uh, the subtitle as well. Uh, and what I mean is the second set of people talks about the need of doing anything we do, innovation, business, and actually even beyond that, everything we do in our life, with a focus on creating value for people. The people being yourself, obviously, you, when you talk about society and when you talk about your private life, but mostly in this book, we talk about the people we serve with our products, with our brands, with our activities in general. So the, the first part of the book is about human centricity. And that's the second set of people in the people in love with people. The first part of the book, uh, the second part of the book, that is the first set of people in love with people, the, 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 the people that are in love, is about uh, these incredible innovators and leaders, entrepreneurs, people that change the world and how they think and how they act and what they do. And then love somehow syn synthesizes it all. It talks about uh, the passion you have for what you do. It talks about the looking at those people that you serve, not as consumers or customers, but as human beings and trying and caring about them and creating value for them. And finally, it talks about uh, the love that you have for others around you. You bring them with you in your mission to create value for society, for people, for your customers and consumers, as often they're called in the business mm. world. Mm. Now, um, thank you for this. And I do want to get into the question of why now you've been collecting notes for a very long time uh why didn't you write a book i don't know five years ago or why didn't you wait another five years what made this the moment to get this book out into the world well the now is very very personal um and because for me this book is not about my visibility as a designer it's not about anything else but something that i I needed to do, I wanted to do, and I wanted to enjoy doing. And because you said it earlier, my life is so busy and intense and, and it's not just my professional life, but also my private life, obviously. I needed to find a moment in my life journey that was stable. And I think what happened is when I found Carlotta, my uh, partner, and we found our own stability and we were ready to have uh, a child. And so, and, and, and the journey of PepsiCo, it was not in startup mode. We were scaling it up and there was a stability and an, I have an amazing team. So once I had the stability in my mind and in my soul, I was like, okay, now I'm ready 
uh, to write, enjoying it first, really literally spending time enjoying it. And then somehow I have a piece of the story that arrived to a specific deadline, not to the end because it's a never ending journey, but to a specific deadline. I can summarize many of the things I learned because I feel that now, you know, I have a stable view of what I learned. I, 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 I had very heights and, and then downs and, and, and I learned so much from both. So I was ready to tell the story in my mind and in my soul. Mm. Ready. That, that again, sounds like a very good uh, feeling to have, like feeling ready to get the story out. And um, I'm sure it's really like in hindsight, you can sort of come up with all sorts, uh, sorts of explanations why this is the moment. But uh, it's really hard to predict up front. At some point, you just you just know you just look, I, I'm in a phase of my life that I reached a few years ago of the key word I would use is awareness. It's like at a certain point, I started to elevate myself above the pain of the everyday or the, you know, intense joys of the everyday. I, 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 I was able in a way or the other, probably through the biggest pains that I, that I had in my life a few years ago to detach myself, look at things in perspective. And I don't know, I, I, I feel that I reached a, a, a maturity that will literally make me enjoy the moment in a better way. I'm not talking about the maturity that make me pitch and, and lecture. And I don't have that kind of arrogance. I'm talking about my feelings, like a sense of awareness that make me enjoy telling that kind of story, writing the story and spending time doing that. Uh, I knew already because I've been writing, you know, for, for years, but uh, the idea of writing, you know, the act of writing actually is also an amazing therapy session for yourself. While you write, you discover things. And, and so I was really ready, like with a sense of awareness to spend time to psychoanalyze myself even more. And then it's beautiful. Something instead that I didn't expect somehow I did, but I didn't realize how intense it would have been is the feedback that you receive on what you wrote and <clears throat> both people reading a book or eventually people listening to conversations like the one we have today and giving you feedback about certain things and realizing that certain ideas you had eventually resonate so much with people that you should double down on those and pitch them even more, especially if those are purposeful ideas, are ideas that are creating value for society. You know, for me personally, that's the biggest satisfaction and the biggest uh, focus that, that that I have. So let's uh, let's dig into that. What were some of the ideas that uh, resonated with the people who were listening to your stories? I give you two. Mm -hmm. One is somehow the um, the reason of the book, essentially the key theme. The, so the first one is uh, the fact that when we talk about design thinking, or we talk about human-centered innovation that for for me as a designer are the same thing but i am purposefully using different words because there may be people out there that are doing design thinking without even realizing that that's design thinking they call it human-centered innovation and there are people out there they don't like too much the word of design for a variety of different personal reasons but they love the idea of human-centered innovation without realizing that it's the same thing so long story short when I realized that, uh, I mean, I realized many years ago, the fact that uh, design thinking, human-centered innovation were so much more than processes and tools and ways of working. And, 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 and no matter that, when you read about design thinking, they, tells you, they tell you about the processes and the ways of working and the double diamond and what you should do to apply this methodology and to be successful. When you go to a, a design firm or an innovation agency, they sell you the, the kind of way of working. When you, they, you do workshop for your teams on that. So uh, when I started this design journey in 3M, I brought in the methodology, the tools and the ways of working. And I started to apply them to uh, dozens and then hundreds of projects. And then looking back, I realized that some were working very well and some others were failing miserably. And so 
I was like, maybe I need to tweak the methodology even more. I need to call different consultants in. I need to hire different kinds of designers. And so, again, you produce more projects and many work and many don't. And at a certain point, I, 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 I realized what was really the variable that was making the difference. And by the way, now I'm going to say it, and it's pretty obvious, but often pe- to- companies don't talk too much about this. The variable is the people behind the tool. The tool is, is like a brush. Put the brush in the hands of Picasso, put the brush in the end of your tax accountant, you'll have a very different kind of painting. And yet, when design thinking doesn't work, these companies accuse and challenge the tool. It's like if you get peace with a brush because the brush didn't create the piece of art of Picasso. So this was the first message. Focus on people, their characteristics, their way of thinking. But if you're a company, you're a CEO, you're a business leader, do it strategically. Not, oh yeah, I need innovative people. That's it. No, what are the characteristics of these people? I have a list of 24 different characteristics that have been so important over the years for me to focus on and be very scientific and strategic and fact-based in hiring those kind of profiles. That's the first. The second <laughs> is when you start to talk about the characteristics of these people, there are a variety that are more expected when you talk about innovation. For instance, the ability to dream, to think big, even though uh, you often, I mean, we are always born with that ability as children. We are dreamers by definition as, as kids and we fantasize and we think big and we ask questions. And then society teaches us to stop dreaming. Dreaming is childish. Dreaming is naive. And yet we protect it until, you know, we go to college, we get, we get out of school, we go to these companies and we're still dreaming a little bit. And we think, yeah, we're going to change this company. We're going to change the world. And then the companies normalize you. The companies put you in a, you know, in a job description, in a flow. And they're like, you need to do this. And so again, the ability to dream is so important, but you also need to combine it with the ability to make things happen, to execute, to uh, be pragmatic, take trade-offs and compromises. So this is one characteristic that is obvious. I see that you have something to say, so I'm going to pause, but no. <laughs> okay. So this is one characteristic, you know, a mix of two that are still somehow obvious, even though very difficult when you hire an innovator. So. Again, let's find people with these traits. But there are other characteristic, uh, characteristics I talk about that are less obvious. Actually, often we talk about the opposite. For instance, kindness, optimism, curiosity. Uh, and, and I can describe each of them and why they're important. If you want, I'm going to do it. But uh, to answer your question, when I started to talk about kindness linked to quality, productivity, team effectiveness, or optimism and curiosity. I saw people were like, wow, you know, I speak about this in conferences. I saw people getting emotional, somebody crying. I see the media focusing so much on this aspect of the book. Everybody's talking about kindness connected to innovation is an association that very rarely you saw. Actually, you, you know, if you think about the history of innovation, there are many great innovators that are the opposite of kind. So why kindness today? But there are a lot of nice and kind people out there. There are so many, more than what I was realizing, because like you and everybody else, we're bombarded by, uh, you know, bad news and, and, and people are not behaving in a proper way in social media. So you start to think that actually humanity is not kind anymore. And then you put kindness out there and you're like, wow, I'm kind too. But they, they don't even tell you that. You feel it. You see people crying when you talk about kindness because they want to be that. But often they are not allowed to be that because they tell them that's weakness is not a strength. It is a strength. All right. Uh, so much to go into. Let's let's. I'll, I'll pick something that I think uh, is very interesting. Is that the things that you describe will probably resonate with a lot of designers. I hope they will resonate with a lot of uh, people in the design practice. Um, they focus a lot on soft skills uh, rather than uh, the the uh, analytical or the hard skills. How do you? How is your message received by 
people with, uh, let's say, a managerial background. Uh, you work in a huge company that's, I guess, about efficiency, productivity, effectiveness. Your message is, is it compatible with uh, that kind of an environment? Look, my effort, and this has been defining my entire, entire <coughs> career, uh, professional journey, my effort has been always the one of combining the two worlds, combining the world of emotion, creativity, uh, intuition with the world of business, data, facts, return on investment, productivity. And so when I talk about kindness, for instance, or optimism and curiosity and a variety of others, there are 24 traits once again. Uh, I always do the effort of linking it back to a value for the business world. So when you essentially, one of the characteristics of these unicorns, I call them in this way, these innovators, these leaders, is the ability to talk different languages. I call them polyglots, and I, I mean cultural polyglots, able to talk the language of business, the language of finance, HR, science, engineering. And so what is key when you talk about something that is a universal value, that is actually building value for companies, for businesses, for uh, business leaders, is key to convey that idea and the message using their language. If I go to a Japanese and I speak to this person in Italian and my content is really, really good, Unfortunately, the Japanese won't understand, even if the Japanese, if you were speaking Japanese, will totally get the greatness of the concept. So if I talk about kindness in a, to a business leader, to a CEO, and I just talk about how kindness is important in society, this person, if he's a good person, is going to resonate with that idea. But he, he or she won't care at all about that idea in the business environment. But if I talk about kindness as a driver of productivity, of efficiency, of effectiveness of teams, if I talk about the fact that the lack of kindness in a, is an invisible cancer inside these corporations because you don't see the negative impact that is generating, but lack of kindness of each of these individuals at scale, multiply for hundreds of thousands of individuals produce a level of redundancy and efficiency that is mind-blowing. And yet, when we talk about investing in productivity or increasing productivity, we talk about cutting costs, optimizing processes, laying off people eventually. And we don't talk about investing in kindness to increase productivity. So uh, the answer to your question is translating Anything we have in mind as designers, innovators, human-centered in, in individuals in something that somehow is relevant for those people. And that's why you need another characteristic of these unicorns that is empathy. You need to put yourself in the shoes of the other person, know the language, polyglot, and translate what you are talking about in something that is relevant to them through empathy and is understandable by them by being a cultural polyglot. It's almost a meta message in this message because you also need to be in love with the people you're sharing this message to. Exactly. That, that, that's why the word love that I choose for the subtitle, it, it would have been even the title. The problem is that people would have thought it was a romantic book. So I needed to squeeze in the word innovation. But the, the word love summarizes it all in a way or the other. If you have that love in three dimensions that I mentioned earlier, love for the people you serve, love for the people around you, love for what you do, then indirectly you have the 24 characteristics of the unicorn, you know, in a way or the other, because the love for what you do push you to get out of your comfort zone as a designer, as an example, and learn other dimensions of the business, of science, of different disciplines, because you understand that to do what you're doing in the right way, you need to learn also those words. Uh, it needs to respect, you know, it leads you to respect people, to embrace diversity, to, to do, as, you know, all those 24 different things that define these incredible innovators. So um, you mentioned the 24 uh, characteristics or tra traits. We don't have time to go into all 24 of them, but you also mentioned uh, unicorns a few times. Now, if people uh, come from a VC background, they might think, are we talking about the billion dollar exit companies? No, we're not. What, what are these unicorns that you mentioned a few times? 
they are these incredible innovators with these 24 different characteristics characteristics i'm going to tell you in a second you know some of them i already mentioned some of them earlier um, but the reason why we call them unicorns is that a few years ago i was there with my team in pepsico talking about the talents we were looking for and then at a certain point somebody was like oh, they're so difficult to find. They're almost impossible to find. They're like unicorns. And since then, we started to call them unicorns. And then when I decided to talk about them in uh, conferences and then immediately after to talk about them in a book, immediately I thought, well, wait a second, there are the multi-billion, I mean, the billion uh, dollar startups that are called in that way is gonna create any kind of uh, confusion. I had this conversation with my publisher and the answer was, well, actually, to build a unicorn, you need unicorns. So that was actually perfect because to build those kind of companies, you need people with these kind of characteristics. And the other thing I realized, um, this, this was before the Italian publication, the book in Italian came out one year earlier, <clears throat> is that the these characteristics that were initially characteristics of the designers of was hiring. I did it. This everything is in the book comes from out of my practice as a designer, you know, in all these years, even though then is translated in theories and 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 uh, and, and uh, advices or suggestions of what worked with me, but very structured, right? You know, is strate is is pure strategy. Uh, but it's all blended with, you know, my life and my experiences. Since I was a kid, there are many stories of, you know, my childhood as well. Uh, <coughs> and so uh, all of this together uh, is, uh, I forgot what I was saying, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Typical I've, of me, I start to, to fly well, up dream, here. And dreaming I, is, a, is an important <laughs> part. <laughs> now, this, this is an organic conversation, so with this... I started uh, <laughs> to diverge. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll transition into, uh, the next question I have, and I know you have a strong opinion about this and uh, that, uh, I think I resonate strongly with as well is, uh, some people, uh, we were talking about the unicorns. Um, but, uh, the other question that I had is, um, nowadays you see more and more people come up with the topic of, we need to stop being human centered. We need to be planet-centered, life-centered, uh, environment-centered. Um, so having people focusing on people might raise some eyebrows. What is your take on this? Yeah, I mean, that topic years ago, I was talking about this and somebody in a post in LinkedIn challenged my idea of human centricity. I was like, enough with being you, you know, human-centered because humans are destroying the planet. We need I was like, oh my gosh, I mean, people saying that don't understand at all what human centricity is about. And in the book, I have a chapter dedicated to this and I uh, make an analogy. I, 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 I ask people to think in this way. Imagine the focus of your human centered innovation is your kids. So, you know, that's your target. You are designing for your kids in a human centered kind of way. Now you want to create something extraordinary for them. Would you ever destroy the bedroom where they sleep, the house where they live, the garden they have around the house? You will not do that, right? Because if you're human center, you don't do it. Human center means that you care about them. So therefore you care about the environment where they live. So real human center innovation is the one that care about the environment where these humans live. How can you be human center creating, you know, something that destroy the place where these humans are living. So human centricity that destroy the planet is not human centricity. It's, it's something that has nothing to do at all with human centricity. So instead of challenging human centricity that is so important, let's focus on the right balance between these humans and the environment where they live. And let, let's respect both. And this is, I think, a super important message. I don't, it's probably not a key message, but it is a, um, a very important message that maybe introducing, like, I don't know, planet centricity uh, takes the focus away from what I totally agree with you with what real human centricity is. Like, we cannot be human centric if we destroy the planet. Like, it doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. 
And, and by, by the way, there is another little nuance that take it even to the next level. In this planet, there are not just the rivers and, you know, the, uh, the forest is and the nature in the planet. There are also other species, animals that live out there and they have the same right that we have to enjoy this planet. And I, uh, there, there is, there is this episode, you know, something that happened recently of, um, I don't remember how you call it in, um, in English, but this animal in, um, in the seas of Norway, I think that was killed, you know, um, it's like a seal, but it's much bigger. I never remember, or a sea lion. Was that this sea lion, I don't know if you saw it in the news, was killed because she migrated from another part of the of the sea um, in the north of Europe, in I think a region close to Norway, you know, on the water, and she was becoming somehow dangerous to people going there with her boats and everything, but simply because she wanted to play with these people and she was becoming an attraction, and so she would jump on the boats of all these people that, by the way, were there to interact with the sea lion. So long story short, she was uh, uh, killed. I'm going to use the word killed. They say euthanized, but uh, this is killing. And then I, you know, I, I challenge that. I condemn that in social media. And recently a guy, a young guy was like, well, why do you do that? The planet belongs to us. We are humans and they are she was threatening humans. And I was like, wow, the planet doesn't belong to us. And when you say human centered, there are two things that you want to consider. One is focusing on the human beings. But the other uh, word that you want to consider is humanity. But the most romantic meaning of the word humanity that is once again connected to love, to empathy, to the ability to love the animals around us. I mean, I have now, as I'm talking to you, I show you, <laughs> I show you earlier my dog, Belle. Like, if you see somebody, if you hear somebody snoring on the background, that's her. She's sleeping always there with me. I have another one, Leone, but God knows where he is right now. But I love them like if they were humans. And I can't step on ants. I can't kill a bee. I can't, you know, think of killing any living uh, being out there and 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 i wish everybody would think in a way i mean this is life life like human life there is life out there now yes you know if there is need in the uh, food a chain to kill some of these animals you know to sustain you know ourselves and everything if you're not vegan or i understand that but any act of cruelty, any act of uh, that is dismissive to the animals out there and the planet out there, you know, the full ecosystem, natural ecosystem out there, it shouldn't be considered human. It's not human. And human centricity, you know, even though it's all about being focused on other humans, should also consider the humanity of these humans and push purposefully that idea. And that's why I love so much how people are reacting to ideas like kindness and empathy in the book, because I'm like, wow, so many people share these kind of values, but we don't talk enough about this. And then it's good that you sort of shine a light, create awareness and uh, create a starting point for the conversation about this, right? That's, I think, already super valuable. So many questions I have for you, but uh, I know our time is limited today. So one one thing I would be uh, I would love to hear from you is what do you see as being currently the biggest barriers of implementing this maybe on a bigger scale? Like if I flip this question around, like what would be needed to accelerate adoption of this mindset, this attitude? You know, I work for companies that are really good at building brands and promoting brands. And, and we should market that idea. We should have um, media embracing that idea. We should have influencers talking about this. If, you know, many of the influencers and the celebrities we're all familiar with who started to talk more about 
the power of kindness, the power of creativity, the power of optimism, the power of curiosity, so many people would follow. And so I don't have the answer. I just described the how. But the point is, how can we make these people more interested on that? You know, and so especially for the media, the more they can celebrate messages like this, the more they, they, they can brand them, make them trendy and celebrate people that embody them, that drive them, the better it is. When they ask me, for instance, who is the business leader that you admire, that you love, that, you know, one of them is Richard Branson. And is the reason is that Richard was able to build the business empire that he did, but also in parallel, he did it in a purposeful way. He was always going after either a problem that he saw in society that he, he experienced by himself, like, oh, the bill of my cell phone is too high. This is crazy. Let me build a company that, that changed completely the way we use cell phones and the way we build for, for, for the kind of service. Train, planes, you know, every time he was seeing a problem, he would try to solve that. But then he went above and beyond that. And so all the causes he's been fighting for, all the way to peace in the world, so that's the other dimension, purpose, purpose, purpose. And then the reason why a particular right Richard is that he did all of this. So business plus purpose, having fun, having fun all his life and challenging himself. And, and so there is the cool factor. So imagine if we had celebrities out there, they will do that. They will build their business empires, but with a purpose and in a cool, fun way. Wow. You know, they would have the power to really change the world. Hopefully the media, the media are very important to celebrate these kind of individuals and, 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 and push the message. That's, that's awesome because these people are there already, right? It's happening. It's already happening. It's, we just need to give them uh, a stage and celebrate them and uh, put a spotlight on them. I think you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Look, look, you know, we live in a world where today, unfortunately too many kids think that fame and money are the goals in life. And, and I say this because as many of these kids that come to me either after a speech or in social media, and they ask me, how can I reach you know, your success? But they literally mean visibility and eventually wealth. And I'm like, if that's your goal, the vast majority of you like listening to us right now will fail because it's difficult to reach fame and wealth. So that's problem number one. But I wish that was just the problem. Actually, uh, I'm happy that it's not just the problem. The problem, the real problem is that even if you reach the fame and wealth, you're not gonna be happy anyway, if you don't have something else. And that something else is the uh, search of your happiness investing in what drives happiness, investing in yourself, in your identity, in your health, in your culture, then investing in others close to you, family, friends, community, giving love and receiving love back, and then investing in something that is bigger than you, a purpose, a cause that essentially will leave a positive memory of you after you are gone, essentially will help you defeating the very idea of death by building legacy. I close actually the book talking about this, this, you know, how to design happiness. And, and we should be driven by that. And, and these are the values that once again, the media should celebrate. This will drive happiness in the society, happiness, even for those celebrities out there. Stop celebrating people that make money, people that get to fame without any content. And let's celebrate people that eventually do also these things because it's still a component of success in this society, but they do it in the right way, celebrating the right values and pushing forward the idea of the society we wanna live in and helping the society being happier and happier. Hmm. I love that. Uh... Now, uh, I have two questions left and um, 
One is uh, if people made it uh, so far into our conversation uh, and reflect back on this, what do you hope is the one thing they will remember? Uh, to go back to their lives and think, am I embracing this idea of love every day? So am I loving the people I am with? Uh, either because, you know, uh, you know, and you can think, am I giving it to them? Am I giving love? And I'm receiving it back. The second thing is, in my work, am I just working for the year-end review for my next position, or I'm working to create something valuable for people out there? No matter what is the job that you do, you could work in a store and creating value for the customers that come in, for those people, those human beings that come in, all the way to you could be the CEO of a corporation creating value for society. And then the third point is, am I loving everything I'm doing every day? I wake up you know, in the morning, I, I look at myself in the mirror, am I thinking I am happy because I'm loving what I do? If you don't in any of these dimensions, think about what can you fix to make it happen? Because if you do, this will give you happiness. And often it's a matter of just becoming aware that you can do small things to change your situation and reach that happiness we've been talking about in this conversation today. And if you need more imp inspiration, I'm uh, sure that the book will help with that. Now, there is one thing we need to do before we leave off, Mauro, and that is to announce the contest. Uh, as I always like to do in these episodes when uh, there is a writer on, uh, uh, on board, is to give a uh, Show uh, an act of kindness by giving a signed copy away. In this case, you're going to give a signed copy away. Uh, it's pretty simple. People need to leave um, the right answer to the question that you're going to share with us right now. What's the question, Mauro? So what is the day of release of the book? You can find it in Amazon very easily. What is the day of release of the book? Oh, leave your answer on this episode and we'll do a raffle amongst the correct answers in uh, in about two weeks after this. And then uh, one lucky person will get a signed copy of your book. I'll be, I'll be jealous uh, and excited for them as well. Maro, again, so many questions here on my notes in front of me, but uh, we'll have to save them for next day. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, like I said, taking the effort of sitting down uh, embarking on this uh, hard journey of writing this and putting this into actual a consistent, coherent story, uh, which is also fun to read. And uh, thank you for coming on and sharing this on the Service Design Show. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody who's been listening to us today. Good luck. Spread the love. <laughs> I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation and that it got you interested to read the full book. If you want to get your hands on it, all the links are down below in the show notes. And in the show notes, you'll also find the details on how you can participate in the contest to win a signed copy of the book. So make sure you read that. Thanks so much for tuning in to the Service Design Show. My name is Mark Fontaine and I look forward to see you soon in the next video.